Hello there, one and all, and welcome to episode 288 of Love at First Scent with me, Percy Lace, coming to you live. As always, you know the drill. If you are regular viewers, live from YouTube, and if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, please do consider doing so. And if you would like to support my work, you will find a link show you how you can do that in the video description below. But we need to get on with the plans for today. And as per usual, we need to see who the first comment is from. And it's Eco Jock saying hi, all. Christine is here as well, saying hello from London. And so is Jer. Do you know, I, my, my mind has split. My mind has split. <laughs> my mind has had a bit of a temporary blip, Joanna, because I've forgotten whether your name actually is Joanna or Joanna. So I, I don't know. My, the, the split mind thing has affected me. But anyway, you are also in London. Hello, everyone from the coast of Maine, USA, says Holly. Good evening from a very hot northern India, says Prashant. And Ola from DC says La Gondam. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah, so as soon as I said Joanna, I thought, no, it's not Joanna, it's Joanna. Anyway, um, I always try to consider the, um, the needs and the requirements of live viewers uh, at the beginning of these episodes. So for those of you planning to stick around for the lives, we are going to be doing one on uh, these bottles here, which I think will take us through at least 20 minutes. And then we will do a classic episode, uh, a classic scent from the 70s, um, that a few of you have requested that I look at. And then depending on how long, long that takes, we may look at a new release. So we may do three episodes back to back today, but we will certainly do at least two. Um, please keep the comments and the questions coming, even if I don't pick up on all of them during the broadcast. I do my very, very best to go back and read them. And if you're not watching the live, then feel free to leave a comment or ask a question. Um, this brand is weird, says DJ. A lot of their stuff are straight, just clones of other fragrances. So I think we should get straight into talking about this brand. The brand in question is the Merchant of Venice, but what you have got here is not a uh, from their main range. Now, Merchant of Venice has been around for a little while, but I am, unless I'm mistaken, I haven't mentioned a single one of their scents uh, here on the channel. I may have done a few reviews over on Persolase.com on the blog, but um, I can't remember. Uh, it's not a brand that I've been able to keep tabs on very well, but whenever I have smelt their work, <clears throat> I've thought, I, I can't say that I've thought that they're just clones of other fragrances, or maybe I haven't sort of given them enough time. I wonder I wonder which ones you think are clones of what, DJ. But I have thought that maybe it's the kind of brand that charges a, a lot of money for um, aspirational type scents that maybe play it safe um, and are not particularly innovative. Um, I, and as I say, I, I haven't given them a huge amount of time. I haven't been I haven't been um, drawn to giving them a, a lot more time. Maybe I need to change that. James says, I feel their perfume smell generic. Yes, that kind of thing. Um, but this is th th this is something different from them. They've had a new creative director for a little while now. Uh, he's a chap called uh, Nicola Pozzani. Um, and th th this is this is one of the things that he um, orchestrated, um, and it's it, it's completely different from their main range. It's called Accordi Accordi di uh, Profumo, and what it is will hopefully over the course of the next few minutes on this episode take us on the course of a bit of a debate about what we think of this kind of concept. I'll explain what it is in a moment, and also what it is that we that that we, we hope to get out of wearing perfumes and why we wear perfumes. La Gondam says, Rococo is a luxurious beachy suntan lotion frag from Merchant of Venice. Love it. Okay, good. So what is this? And please don't switch off because I'm about to say the L word, the L word being layering. This is a layering concept that is uh, just about to launch in the UK. It's coming out in July in the UK, although I think it is available worldwide already from the Merchant of Venice's own website. Uh, Herb, <laughs> Herb has already gone, oh no. I knew some of you would react like that, but let's just go with it for the moment and let's have a very, very serious conversation about layering and what we think. Eric is also going, uh, layering. 
Um, Rachel says, the brand is new to me, so looking forward. Uh, layering, turning this off, says Lindsay. Give it six months before it's discontinued. Gosh, tough crowd. You guys are a tough crowd. If anybody... Well, I suppose that's why I like you, though, because because it, it, you, you keep me on my toes as well. I, I love layering perfume, says Khadija. It makes me feel like a chemist. OK, maybe we'll come back to that one. So this is a layering concept uh, that is going to launch in the UK next month and is going to be exclusive to H Beauty outlets. H Beauty are the, uh, are the beauty offshoot um, shops of Harrods. Uh, the H stands for Harrods. And uh, the, the the range launches with eight cents, and each one is supposed to be an accord. Do you see what they did there? That's why they're called accordi. Um, so they are not pure ingredients, and the brands don't pretend that they are pure ingredients. And from this side of the screen to the other, they are an orange, uh, a bergamot, a tuberose, a neroli, a tonka, a saffron, a patchouli, and a sandalwood. And the idea is that you buy as many or as few as you would like. Perhaps you only just want to buy the one. Um, and then you take them home. So say you've bought three, you've tried them in the shop, and you've decided that actually you like the way the bergamot smells, and I don't know, the, the narrowly and the patchouli. And then you have a play with them, and you uh, layer them to create different effects. Um, or as uh, Nicola Pozzani himself told me, maybe you wear just one of them at the start of the day, but then you want to kind of change the effect slightly a couple of hours later by layering it with something else. Essentially, you do whatever the heck you like with these eight that you have got at your disposal. And presumably, if the concept is successful, there will be more on, on the way. Prashant says, so a bit like eccentric molecules, um, I'm going to say no, because eccentric molecules, at least the molecule uh, bottles, fragrances, are just one ingredient. The, these these are a cord, so this, it's not pure bergamot oil, it's not pure uh, tuberose absolute or anything like that. They are a cords that have been fashioned by Givaudan perfumers. I'll read you a little bit of the press release in a moment. Um, and, and as I say, you, you're meant to layer them. We've got a few fans of layering coming through. Layering is phenomenal, says Smoke C. Um, I'd love to find out why. Tell us a little bit more about why you like, because I personally never, ever do it. And I, and I think, um, actually, it would just open such a can of worms if I were to start layering the sense that I've got that I'd probably never be able to leave the house. But obviously, I know that a lot of people do do it. Um, I mentioned a colleague the other day who I think I think I said that she layers Allure, Chanel Allure, with um, Coco Mademoiselle. And it certainly worked interestingly on her. Jo Malone, Jo Malone as a brand, um, have, have, you know, made, made an, an entire industry out of, out of layering. But um, I'd like to uh, find out why it is that some of you like it. If I could find a great musk and jasmine combo, says Holly, I would layer away. Nubianette says, I like layering. I have four Giardino Banaceras. They mostly stand on their own. Um, okay. Like Experimental Perfume Club too, says Christine. Okay, maybe a little bit more like Experimental Perfume Club, but the idea with them, I suppose, is that you are meant to pour into a bottle uh, a, a, a perfume that you have made yourself out of the accords that you've brought for, bought from them. Layering is blasphemy, says Emil. <laughs> okay, right to the other end of the spectrum. So, because I would like to have a little bit of um, audience participation here, we are going to play the layering game. I would like to get some suggestions from you as to um, which of these three you would like me to experiment with layering um, on, on a blotter. But we need to set some parameters, okay? So we're going to say no more than three per um, layering experiment, because, you know, I, I can just imagine some clever clogs is going to say, we'll sp spray all of them. And we'll also say no more than two sprays of each one. So, you know, you could say to me, you want one spray of the bergamot with one spray of the narrowly and two sprays of the patchouli. I don't know. So so keep some of the, think of some of the ones that you'd like me to try, and we will do that in a moment. In order to save time, I have actually pre-sprayed them individually um, on blotters, just to give you a sense of what they are. So again, going in the order in which we've got them here, the arancha, of course, is the orange. And, and again, just to try and be as scientific as possible, I did no more than 
two sprays per blotter. The orange certainly opens as bright and se as zesty and orangey and sweet as, as you would expect, but it is quite volatile and it's already starting to fade. So we were 10 minutes into the video and I spray them about 10 minutes before we start broadcasting. So this is about 20 minutes old, if you like, already, but certainly very, very photorealistic. The bergamot, um, I do like, and it, it, it's, it's, it's got that nice, you know, earl grey smokiness, citrusiness that you want from a bergamot. So again, absolutely what it says on the tin. The tuberose, is perhaps not as rich and opulent and lush as you might hope. You know, this, this isn't a sort of cheap way of getting hold of a lot of tuberose absolute, but it is recognizably a tuberose. It's creamier, muskier, maybe a little bit harsher around the edges than you might have expected or you might have hoped for, let's say. You know, it, it's just not got the drama that you get maybe from something like Frederick Malkan or Flower. The narrowly, narrowly, very, very, very attractive as well. Um, again, you know, the, the, these these completely are what they are meant to be. So in the narrowly, you do get that gently white floral aspect that you would expect from a narrowly, but also the orangey feel, the citrusy feel. Um, something a bit honeyed going on there. You know, th there isn't a single one of these uh, that makes you, you know, when you smell it, that makes you think, who are they kidding? This isn't a bergamot or this isn't a narrowly. Um, Tonka, no mansplaining here. What are you people talking about? I'm, I'm going to have to read the comments back. The tonka bean. Now, tonka is an interesting ingredient because, of course, you would expect tonka bean to be quite rich in coumarin and to have that hay-like almondy quality of coumarin. Now this doesn't head in that direction so much and it's much more about a texture so it's gentle, sweet, heading towards powdery, maybe a little bit velvety but not not overwhelming uh, with that coumarinic note. Dare I say it may be a little bit synthetic. The saffron. The saffron, again to give the brand their due, they do say that the saffron doesn't contain any natural saffron, that it is entirely an accord. The saffron, um, somebody's going to win a Fifi award for what? I'm <laughs> well, you 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 lot just carry on talking to each other and having fun. I'm gonna have to read these comments. The saffron is actually a lot more about Cypriol. And if you think of some of those um <sighs> Cypriol and Labdanum, and if you think of some of those uh generically Arabian scents that do that kind of rose leather thing, um, rose leather saffron thing, then you get a sense of what the saffron is like. Um, not my favourite, I think, because it's kind of going into generic -y territory. The patchouli um, is a lot cleaner than you would expect it to be. I guess they, they couldn't allow each of these to be too assertive and didactic in its own right because they want it to work with others, right? So this isn't a patchouli that could just be straight up worn on its own as a patchouli. It hasn't got the full-on earthy quality that you would get from a really, really good quality patchouli oil, but it is recognizably patchouli. It's got that camphoraceous note to it. And you know how some modern patchoulis are cleaned up and almost start heading into marine territory. It's got it's got that kind of feel to it as well. And then there's the sandalwood, um, which is, they're not even pretending it's meant to be an Indian sandalwood. It's as you can see here, it's it's got Australia written on the bottle. Um, and this one is the, the, there are moments because I have smelt it before. There are moments where I've sort of thought, oh dear, is it going to take us down a synthetic sandalwood route, which, as you know, is is one of my pet hates. But then sometimes I smell it and I think, no, it's a lot gentler than that. It's got a sweeter quality to it. The sandalwood will be Javanol, most likely, says Herb. Well, if there is Javanol in here, it, it's it's definitely toned down. It's not overused. It's Australian grown Indian sandalwood, says Woozy. Now, this is also the brand's foray into the realms of um, sustainability. So if I can just read you a little bit of the press release, because the, the, the brand are very, very um, much hoping that the, the sustainability, the environmental consciousness side of things is, is going to be a major selling point for these 
uh, accords. The Merchant of Venice, it says, has always celebrated the history of Venetian perfumery by retracing the Mude, the trade routes that brought perfumed raw materials to Venice. In 2022, with the Accordi di Profumo collection, the Merchant of Venice reinterprets the most iconic ingredients of perfumery, some of which were already described in the ancient botanical manuscripts of the Serenissima era with an eye to sustainability and the future. Accordi is an innovative collection of eight nature-conscious eau de parfum of exceptional olfactory quality, created in an exclusive partnership with Givaudan, a leading fragrance manufacturer. Sharing the commitment of the Givaudan Foundation and the Sourcing for Good project, Accordi aimed to highlight the passion, expertise and commitment to the process of sourcing the best raw materials for the common good. At the heart of each fragrance is a selection of sustainable and responsibly sourced ingredients that guarantee traceability and maximum transparency on their origin, contributing to the livelihood of local communities. And I think they are very, very serious about it. And they're also even serious about the sustainability of everything to re related to the packaging. Um, what's Khadija saying? The going to a restaurant and expecting a finished dish from a chef analogy to a finished perfume is interesting. In KBBK, you make your own dish just like in layering perfumes. Maybe it's cultural. Okay, so we want to get onto the thing of layering in a moment. Accordi is the Italian for accords, and in the language of perfumery represents a harmonious combination of fragrance notes. The name of the collection is intended to recall the cultural soul of the brand, etc., etc. In a view of sustainability and greater attention to the environment, each fragrance comes in a 30 ml glass bottle made in Italy. The matte white finish and glossy black cap enhance the colorful touch of the label, which bears the name of the fragrance and recalls the olfactory family. The boxes, made of biodegradable paper obtained from algae, exhibit an ancient representation of the raw material in the background with the same nuances. Um, and just to give the perfumers their due, uh, the bergamot is made by Roxanne Kirkpatrick, all juvenile perfumers, obviously. The orange is by Michael Carby. The Neroli is none other than Jan Vanier. The tuberose is Dahlia or Dahlia Izem. The Tonka and the Saffron are made by Jordi Fernandez. The patchouli is from Marion Costero, and the sandalwood is also by Jordi Fernandez. So, who is going to go first with telling me which ones to layer? I've got larger blotters here. Um, orange and sandalwood are lovely together. Is that because you've already tried them, or you... Okay, Woozy's given very precise instructions. Two tuberos, two patchouli, two tonka. Okay, I think that's what we will do. Two tuberos. Actually, I should I should do it here so you can see me doing. I don't want to get any in the curtains around my hands. Two tuberos. What was it? Two patchouli and two tonka. So I'm going to do it in that order. Two patchouli. Why have we got to go two 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 when the ratio is equal? Why couldn't I have just done one one one? Or is it just because you want me to? <laughs> and two tonka. Okay. I have not tried this combination. I haven't tried very many combinations at all. In fact, most of the boxes I um, unsealed just before we started the broadcast. And who was this for? This was for Woozy. Okay, Woozy, this one's for you. Very tuberosy. And the patchouli is coming through as well. It's, the tonka seems to be making it very, very sweet. Now, okay, let me just try and reset it a little bit. I do have to say that just on the strength of this quick spray on a blotter, it, it, it does feel like what I'm smelling is, is kind of pretty much a fully composed perfume, which is interesting. Interesting if it would make a difference in what order you layered the sprays, says Anak. Yeah, I, I wondered about that as well. Um, the, the thing is, you know, this is not a very scientific way of doing these tests, because if you now ask me to reverse the order, my nose has already started to get saturated from smelling this. Does the smell blend nicely or they just sit on top of each other? Well, no, actually, you know, I did actually think I, th I thought that I would I would just smell, you know, the tuberose and then I'd smell the patchouli and the tonka. But there does seem to be genuinely a kind of blending effect going on where 
Maybe it's because the tonka, like I said, is much more about a texture. And it seems to be almost like velvetizing and powderizing the tuberose and the patchouli and somehow bringing them together. Right, Woozy, I'm going to label this blotter with your name so that we come back to it, because, of course, the proof is in the development. Let's pop that one here. Have I got any um, more instructions? Gaza says, hate to sound grumpy, be as grumpy as you like, but I cannot see these ever working. I'll have a go when they go on sale in the TK Maxx dump bins. <gasps> Do you think that's going to happen? Um, ooh, Maudlin says, one sandalwood, two saffrons, and an orange. I'll see what I can do for you, sunshine. Let's go. So, one sandalwood. Oh, that one didn't go there. So, I think we'll have to call it one and a half because I personally doesn't know how to aim live on YouTube. One sandalwood, two saffrons, and then an orange. Okay. Two saffrons. <laughs> I feel, like, I feel like I should be, and an orange, I don't know, I feel like I should be, what, what should I be, working at a shop? Okay. So this, ladies and gents, and this was from whom? Hang on. Uh, I've already lost it. From Maudlin, Maudlin. Okay, so I better um, label that before we forget, because otherwise, when I when, cause when I look back at the comments, I'll be able to work out what was actually on these. Okay, I think I have got a, a, a kind of natural bias against the, the, the thing that the saffron is doing, you know, with that faux Arabian thing that I mentioned um, earlier. But the, the way the orange is linking with the sandalwood and that kind of saffrony note is intriguing because... On the one hand, it seems to be clashing, and yet the contrast seems to actually bring out slightly different facets. So suddenly, from the orange, I seem to be picking out drier, more saffron-like elements. It, it, it's almost as though it's brought out the saffronness of the saffron accord, which isn't necessarily there on its own. Um, and the sandalwood... If it, if it does have a lot of the synthetic-y, sandalwood-y stuff when you spray it on its own, that doesn't seem to be coming through on this blotter. G giving Tom Cruise in cocktails, says Eric. What are you talking about now? <laughs> Can Woozy please name his perfume? Oh, you want to... Mr. Bartender says, okay, right, so this is me. Okay, right. Shall we do the whole... Um... If we want to elicit disgust, as in from me, let's go for two saffrons, a sandalwood and two tonkas and an optional Viking cologne spritz. Ah, I'm going to click end broadcast now. Before we do one last one and, and, and let this have a moment to develop and then we'll resmell it. Was it Rachel? Rachel, I don't want to lose yours. Has it already gone? You said one sandalwood, two Neroli's and two bergamots for summer. I think I'd like to try that one, but I'll try and remember before the comment goes away. One sandalwood, two Neroli's, two bergamot. Let's just generally talk about layering. Because when the brand presented this to me, they said that they really see this as being the future of perfumery. And I, and I must confess, I, I, I got a little bit frightened at the idea of that because I, I think it would be terrible if if the future of perfumery were nothing but going into a shop and buying a few accords and then going off and layering various things. Now, the, the, the brand then did sort of retract that. You know, it wasn't an official statement. They said that they absolutely don't think that what we consider to be um, perfumery at the moment will go away, but that we will probably have more and more things like this. Because, I don't know, and this 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 is where things become a little bit geeky, I suppose. But 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 I know that you will understand where I'm coming from because because um, we are geeky on this channel, aren't we? If I hear that uh, you know Thierry Vasser and Delphine Jelk are about to release a new perfume for Garlin, or you know, let's say Francis Kirkjean is about to release his first major work for Dior, then I genuinely want to find out what it is that they have done. I'm not even necessarily particularly interested 
in whether it's going to be a perfume that I myself will want to wear. Obviously, I would love to be able to wear it, but if I've, you know, if I find out that, say, Francis Kirkjean has decided that his first major release for Dior is going to be something aimed at very, very young women, then I will think, okay, well, it's clearly not for me, but I still want to know what he has done. I want to know whether he has um, taken that idea in a different direction. I want to see whether he's done anything clever with the materials um, he's used. Um, and, and, and so basically, I guess what I'm saying is I want to have some kind of a conversation through the perfume with its creator. Now, you don't have a conversation with the creator here because the whole idea is that you've just been taken these colours or these tools or these notes that uh, that have been created for you and you're meant to be the creator yourself. And it's just not something that I have ever really been interested in, which a lot of people consider to be quite strange because I think they think that as I'm a perfume geek, this would absolutely be my cup of tea. Um, and yet it isn't. Messing around with actual raw ingredients is a different thing entirely. And I do always try to keep a, a, a stash of the key raw materials um, at home, just so that I can smell them for reference, but also just sometimes so I can say, oh, you know, what does actually happen when you mix, I don't know, patchouli with cashmere or, or whatever. Um, but but that, that, that's different. That's done for reference, not necessarily for something to wear. Um, and I suppose in a way, this takes away from the artistry of perfume and, and turns it into a much more functional kind of product. But I suppose I also have to admit and acknowledge that for a lot of people out there, it is quite a functional product. It is just another, um, an, another entry on the list of accessories that you don um, before you go out to work. Um, I want to see what people are saying here. The future of perfumery could be a complete ban, to be honest. Yeah, you're not wrong there, you're actually, you're not wrong at all. Um, is perfume going down the fashion of deconstruction, says somebody whose comment has just been lost off the screen. I will come back to that one. Um, Khadija says, I think I see perfume as an aspect of my wardrobe and self-expression because of growing up in a culture where perfume is used so much. Layering aptars and perfumes has never been something weird, to be honest. And yes, I suppose if you have been brought up with that, then you wouldn't see it as being odd. Um, Herb says, I don't know, I, I don't know which notes I want together. I want someone to decide and dose them for me. Great perfumers make things that are infinitely more than the sum of their parts. I couldn't agree more. And also they make things that we didn't know we would love, things that we didn't know we wanted, things that we didn't know we needed in our world, right? Um, Eric says, I'm truly worried that these are 75 to to $100 each. I'd rather buy Jiki Extra. They are, they are not cheap because they are 30 mil bottles and they're 60 pounds, right? So that means that if you did want three, you would have to pay 180 pounds and you would get for your trouble uh, 90 mils. Um, and then if you if you really did fall in love with one of the combinations, but what the combination entailed you're using, you know, three times as much of one as the other two, then you would you would have to buy that one more frequently. So they're, they're not cheap, they're not cheap. Um, uh, uh, Joanna says, if this was to be the future of perfumery, it would be one more tragic expression of the anti-expert sentiment. I don't disagree. Uh, 60 euros for 30 mil, says Gavin. <laughs> Ouch, says Eric. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not cheap. They're not cheap. Um, but I think if this concept is going to work, and if it is going to be part of the perfume landscape, then I think this is probably the way to do it. And maybe that if they see that there's more of a demand for the sort of citrus notes, then they'll sort of extend the green range. If there's more of a demand for the florals, then they'll extend this 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 dusky pink range. Um, did you get 420 euros worth of perfume for free? Says Gavin. These these are these are press review samples. And to answer your question, no, I did not pay for them. Don't forget, I always say in the video description below. Um, uh, where where the samples have come from. But we need to finish now because we're almost at the half hour mark. Now, what was it from Rachel, right? We had one sandalwood and then two narrowly, two bergamot. Let's, let's end on a bright note. Right, so one sandalwood, two narrowly. Oh, gosh, that narrowly went a little bit diffusive everywhere. And one bergamot. 
No rose, says Gino. No, I thought it was interesting that there's no rose. I suppose that must be on the card. It's bound to be on the cards, isn't it? Um, Rachel, thank you very much. One sandalwood, two narrowly, two bergamot for summer. I remembered. Um, this one has really got our blood boiling, says Yura. Oh, well, keep the comments coming because you never know. Pe people involved with the brand may read the comments. So this may be your opportunity um, to, to give them some feedback. More bergamot. Be a garland, says Gavin. <laughs> I'm following instructions. Ooh, that's really nice, Rachel, actually. That's... But I think it's because the bergamot here I do like. Um, given the Italian heritage, I would have expected an iris, says Woozy. You put just one bergamot. Did I? Did I? Okay, I'm going to take your word for it, seeing as you're the ones watching. Let's do... Let's do one and then let's just do another one for good measure. Let's go Garla. Um, but now it will just be bergamot. This would be like a really good aqua allegoria. Um, Scott says, great concept that would be fun to try, just not at that price. Yeah. And I wonder if that's going to be the thing, the issue for a lot of people, because 60 pounds is a lot of money for, for 30 mils. Is, it is a lot of money. Um, Okay, so yeah, as you would expect, after that bergamot overload, I'm getting bergamot, 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 with that kind of white floral orangey thing of the narrowly coming through. But actually, you know, the sandalwood is doing its thing there as well. This is attractive. This is attractive. But so maybe, maybe that's the thing. Maybe the idea, the best thing would be to to overdose on one and then just do a couple of sprays of something else for a bit of contrast. Um interesting okay thank you very much for watching um go away have a think about this let me know let me know what you make of it we will be back in a few minutes with another live video for those of you sticking around a classic from the 70s um but just give me a few moments to clear all this lot away but i will see you very soon thank you for watching this one see you in a bit bye <laughs>